Imagine this, 18th century France. It's a time when, well, let's be honest, female intellect wasn't exactly celebrated. No, definitely not. Often dismissed. Right. And yet, picture a woman in her own home conducting physics experiments, challenging the biggest scientific names in Europe. That's Emily du Châtelet, born 1706. Exactly. And she's who we're diving deep into today. Our goal here is pretty straightforward. We want to give you the key takeaways fast. Uh-huh. We're looking at biographical accounts to understand this, well, frankly, amazing woman. How she just defied all the expectations of her time and made a real mark on science, on thought itself. Yeah, our mission, if you like, is to shed light on her key contributions, her story. It's genuinely inspiring. She faced these huge societal hurdles, didn't she? Oh, absolutely. But her influence, scientifically and philosophically, it really lasts. We'll be digging into excerpts from biographies to get a feel for her life, her context. Okay, so let's uh, let's unpack that context. Okay. 18th century France. What were the main roadblocks for a woman like her, someone with real intellectual curiosity? It sounds tough. It was incredibly restrictive. I mean, intellectual pursuits. That was seen as, well, men's terror. All right. Women were supposed to focus on... Domestic life, managing the household. <laughs> Showing too much intellectual interest could be seen quite negatively. A social misstep, almost. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Even scorn. The idea of a woman making real contributions to science or philosophy, people were skeptical, to say the least. But the sources say she refused to be contained. I love that phrasing. It's perfect, isn't it? How did she actually manage it? How did she push past those limits? Well, it seems it came down to sheer determination and this uh, just unquenchable thirst for knowledge. So she taught herself. Pretty much. She launched into this intense self-education program, devouring books in Latin, Italian, English. Language is usually reserved for the men of her class, right? Exactly. This wasn't just showing off her language skills. It was, you know, a conscious act. It gave her access to all this cutting-edge thinking across Europe. Access denied to most other women. Precisely. And she wasn't just reading alone in a corner. No. No. She actively got involved. She debated with the leading thinkers of the day. She even turned her salons, you know, these social gatherings, uh -huh. into intellectual hotspots, places for real debate. That's bold, transforming social spaces into intellectual ones. Very bold for the time. Okay, so let's talk about a really key part of her scientific work, the vis viva debate. Sounds intense. It was a major scientific argument, yeah. What was it fundamentally about, and how did Emily get right in the middle of it? Well, the core issue was about energy, essentially. How do you measure the force, or what we'd now sort of call energy, of something moving? Okay. You had some scientists following Newton saying it was mass times velocity, simple MeV. Right. But others, inspired more by Leibniz, thought there was something else going on. Emily looked at Newton's ideas and saw they didn't quite explain everything, certain physical events. And she didn't just argue about it theoretically, did she? I read about experiments. Lead balls, Clay. Yes. That's what's so great. She wasn't just about the philosophy. She believed in testing things, empirical evidence. So she literally got her hands dirty. You can picture it, can't you? Sleeves rolled up, maybe. She designed experiments, dropping lead balls into clay. To measure what exactly? The impact, how deep the ball went. And by measuring that very carefully, she gathered really strong evidence. Evidence for what? That the energy of the moving object wasn't just proportional to velocity v, but to velocity squared, mv2. Wow. So through hands-on experiments, she's laying the groundwork for kinetic energy as we know it. That's exactly a fundamental principle in physics. Her experimental work was crucial support for that idea. That's... That's pretty remarkable. It really is. It underpins so much from how planets move to just, you know, everyday mechanics. Then, of course, there's her relationship with Voltaire. Very famous. Very. And it wasn't just personal, was it? It was this powerful intellectual partnership, too. Right. Their place at Siri. It became this hub. Absolutely. A real powerhouse for Enlightenment thinking. They collaborated, challenged each other, worked on projects together. Sounds like a very stimulating environment. But the biographical sources also bring up a tricky point. Mm. They ask, essentially, how often does a brilliant woman's work get credited to her famous male partner? Hmm, that's such a critical question. How many times must a woman's genius be mistaken for her lover's inspiration? It makes you wonder, doesn't it? How much of her own original thinking might have been overshadowed just because Voltaire was, well, Voltaire the famous male writer? 
It's a recurring theme, sadly, in the history of women in science and philosophy. Their partnership was clearly important, no doubt mutually beneficial. But the biases were there. The societal biases, exactly. It could easily lead to her independent work being underestimated or just assumed to be his. Okay, let's shift to perhaps the most dramatic part of her story. Her pregnancy at 42. Yeah. And this incredible drive to finish translating Newton's Principia Mathematica. It was genuinely a race against time. Being pregnant at 42 in the 18th century, it was incredibly risky. She knew the risks. Oh, she absolutely knew. And that's why she was so determined to finish this work, what she saw as her legacy project, before she potentially died in childbirth. And wasn't just a translation, was it? That sounds like underselling it. Massively underselling it. Translating Newton's Latin Principia was a huge task in itself, but she did much more. Like what? She clarified his arguments, which could be really dense. She actually found and corrected some errors in Newton's original work. Wow, correcting Newton. Yes, and she added this extensive commentary, expanding on his ideas with her own insights. She was making it accessible, yes, but also advancing the understanding of it. That's a massive intellectual undertaking. Monumental. And the accounts picture her just working relentlessly in those final months. Day and night, apparently. Utterly focused. And she finished the manuscript just days before the baby was born. Mere days. And then, tragically, died from complications shortly after the birth. It just speaks volumes about her dedication, yeah. her understanding of how important that work was. Absolutely. Her commitment to knowledge was just unwavering. And her translation, it's still the standard French edition of the Principia today. Incredible. A lasting testament. No question. Which makes it even more frustrating to hear how, initially at least, her own achievements were kind of sidelined, mm. dismissed as a dilettante, mm. just because she was associated with Voltaire. It really shows the depth of the prejudice back then. Her link to Voltaire, while obviously a huge part of her life, gave people an easy excuse, didn't it? Yeah, a way to diminish her own work. Dilettante was such a common put down for women who dared to step outside those very narrow prescribed roles. But history seems to be correcting that now. The sources stress her impact is undeniable, especially with the Principia. Undeniable. And they mention another major work, too, Institution de Physique. What was that about? Ah, yes, Institution de Physique. That was also hugely important. It wasn't just a physics textbook. No. It dug into really fundamental philosophical questions. What is knowledge? What is space? Time. It stirred up a lot of debate. So she was a serious philosopher of science, too. Definitely. She established herself as an original thinker in that field, pushing the boundaries of what people were thinking about. It's good to see she's getting more recognition now, though. Yeah. I saw mentions of a crater on Venus named after her. Yes. And a minor planet, various awards, institutes, even a Google Doodle a few years back. That's great. Feels like a, well, a long overdue appreciation. It's a positive shift, for sure. These honors reflect a better understanding of just how significant her contributions were across different fields. But as the biographical sources say, maybe her real legacy isn't just the science or the translation. Right. It's that intellectual courage, the courage to question everything, to push boundaries, to pursue knowledge relentlessly despite the obstacles. So as we kind of wrap up our deep dive here, what are the big takeaways? What can we learn from Emily du Chatelet's life today? I think maybe the biggest one is understanding what we lose when talent gets stifled. Think about it, if Emily had just accepted the limits society tried to put on her. We wouldn't have her insights into physics or philosophical work, that crucial translation. Exactly. The world would be poorer for it. Her life really pushes us to look at ourselves, doesn't it? How so? Well, it makes you ask, what boundaries are we accepting without questioning them? Are they external or maybe internal? Hmm. What passions or ideas might we have put on a shelf because we thought, oh, I can't do that, or that's not for me? Precisely that. Her story is a potent reminder about, well, perseverance, about intellectual curiosity, and having the guts to challenge expectations. Yeah. It connects directly back to her own words you mentioned earlier. Yeah. The biographical excerpts quote her, let us choose for ourselves our path in life. And let us try to strew that path with flowers. It's a lovely quote. It is. And it brings us full circle to that first image, the woman with the candle, figuratively speaking, lighting up the scientific world in 18th century France. So the question becomes, for all of us listening, what will you do with your candle, your potential? Will you let it flicker out? Or will you embrace that spirit of questioning, of striving, of yeah. shining? It's a call to action, really. And maybe a final thought to leave everyone with. Yeah. 
the world is still full of shadows, isn't it? Still full of things we don't understand. Always. And the next big breakthrough, the next revolution in thinking. It could genuinely start with your own refusal to just accept the limits someone else tries to set for you, just like Emily. Mm 